Well, brethren, once again, we come to the God who, though he often complained to his people when they drew near with their lips, but their hearts were far from him, I don't believe I've ever read a verse where God scolded his people for coming to him again and again and again. In fact, I think we can all think of a couple of parables that Jesus told that underscore the fact that God wants us to trouble him, that he would even, as it were, leave himself vulnerable to the image of an unjust judge to get a point across how much more shall God avenge his own elect which cry to him day and night. So let's cry in the confidence that he loves to hear our cry and he loves it more when we expect that our cry is heard and will be answered. So let's seek him again. Holy Father, we acknowledge that left to ourselves we are a mass of unbelief, of hesitancy, We misjudge the largeness of your heart, the willingness you have shown us to give and to give and to give again. So help us even now that we might come boldly to the throne of grace in order to obtain mercy and to find grace. Grant us the mercy and grace we need for this hour Uphold your servant, empower him by the Spirit. Come by your grace to each of these dear men that their minds and hearts will be disposed to respond eagerly to the truth. Give them a fresh baptism of the Spirit of the Bereans who receive the word with readiness of mind but continually searching the Scriptures to see if indeed these things were so. So we plead with you to come and meet with us and make us better servants of Christ as a result of this next hour together. We ask through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Well, brethren, we've thus far considered the responsibilities of the man of God as a leader in those gatherings of the church for stated worship, especially the services mandated by the scriptures. And then I set before you some directives for leading those services, though not explicitly mandated by scripture, are precipitated primarily by ecclesiastical and cultural traditions. We're now going to focus our attention upon the responsibilities of the man of God in conjunction with those gatherings of the people of God specifically designated as seasons for corporate prayer. As we take up this subject, as you will see in your notes, I want to address two issues on the, at the outset. One, a matter of definition, then the other, a matter of justification. By the use of the phrase corporate meetings for prayer, I'm referring not to those corporate meetings where prayer may be an essential or even a frequent part of its activities. Because in a very real sense, any gathering of the people of God ought to be marked by eminent prayerfulness if we're going to be comfortable with 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 8. When Paul is giving specific directions for behavior in the house of God, he says, I will first of all that prayer, supplication, intercession, giving of thanks be made for all men. In one of the tragedies, of the erosion of biblical truth and practice in evangelicalism in our day is that so-called services of worship will have a couple of little mini chit-chat sessions by the reverend, but they are not permeated with eminent prayerfulness. And so when I say we're going to be considering corporate meetings for prayer, I'm not referring to meetings where there is prayer, where there may be much prayer, or where several brethren may be gathered to pray in a small group. 
I'm referring specifically to those gatherings in which the church as a corporate body is called together for the express purpose of seeking the face of God in prayer. In other words, I'm referring to such gatherings as are described in Acts chapter 12, verse 5 and verse 12. Peter therefore was kept in the prison, but prayer was made earnestly of the church unto God for him. And then verse 12, And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. Preaching was not the dominant activity, exhorting, fellowshipping. They were gathered specifically to pray. So that's what I mean by the term corporate meetings for prayer. Now just a word of justification. On what grounds can we pick up this subject and bring it into the sphere of careful, critical analysis and structured thought and counsel? I answer as follows. As surely as God honoring public worship does not just happen, but is the result of biblical thinking, issuing in careful planning and in prayerful dependence upon the Holy Spirit, so it is with God-honoring meetings for corporate prayer. While it is always essential to remember that effective prayer, whether private or corporate in nature, is dependent, is dependent upon the presence and operations of the spirit of grace and supplication, God's working and our careful working and planning are not antithetical. We're back to our fundamental theology of the Christian life as captured in a text such as Philippians 2, 12 and 13. So then, beloved, as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure." God's working does not negate the necessity of my working, and my working does not cancel the reality of His working. His working is manifested in my working, and my working is the outflow of His working. That is a sound theology that touches every single facet of Christian experience and also of the Christian ministry. So we must think through this subject to its biblical foundations and then wisely act in the grace and power of the Holy Spirit to give clear and gracious, assertive guidance to our people with respect to how they conduct themselves in their seasons of corporate prayer. As we take up this vital subject together, I will attempt to present the material under four major headings. My first division of the material is this. I want to give a broad overview of the central place of corporate prayer in the life of the New Testament church. Now, in approaching the subject from an exclusive use of the New Testament data, I am in no way inferring that the Old Testament is not rich in materials relative to the duty, the patterns, the practice of corporate prayer in the visible covenant community of God's people. In this matter, as in everything pertaining to our understanding of the full spectrum of church life, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 is changelessly true. When Paul wrote to Timothy and said, All Scripture is God-breathed and profitable to the end that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished, he was referring primarily 
to the Old Testament Scriptures. Paul can take a principle from Old Testament civil law and put it on an equal plane with the very words of Jesus in telling the New Covenant community how to treat their pastors. The laborer is worthy of his hire. He quotes Jesus. But then he quotes from an element of Old Testament civil law, you shall not muzzle the ox that treads out the corn. And he says an Old Testament principle of civil law is normative for the new covenant community. Now if the Apostle Paul does that without any embarrassment, we should approach the scriptures believing that in all of scripture there is data to make us thoroughly furnished unto every good work by historical examples, prophetic denunciations and encouragements, by the peculiarly rich material found in the book of Psalms, the Old Testament is rich in the raw materials for instruction on the subject of corporate prayer. When turning to the Old Testament for topical preaching on prayer or when preaching consecutively through sections of the Old Testament, you will inevitably find much to validate in your own understanding that indeed God breathed scripture including the Old Testament is rich in materials for teaching, reproof, correction, training in righteousness for the new covenant community. Beware of the statement, we are New Testament Christians. If you are, I pity you. No, we are whole Bible Christians. While consciously living under the climactic provisions and light of the new covenant and God's final word in Christ, we are whole Bible Christians. Our Lord and his apostles take us back again and again to the Old Testament to buttress and to enforce duties and privileges of the new covenant community. However, time will not permit me to examine with you those rich materials from the Old Testament. Therefore, this is my polemic for my terminology. We're going to consult only the New Testament in order to give this overview of the central place of corporate prayer in the life and experience of the New Covenant community. In attempting to collate the biblical materials under this first heading, I have three divisions of the material will consider an overview of the central place of corporate prayer in the life of the New Covenant community, number one, in the teaching of our Lord, number two, in the life and experience of the apostolic church, and number three, the specific directives found in the apostolic letters. First of all, then, in the teaching of our Lord. Our Lord gave much recorded teaching concerning prayer in general. However, our concern is to focus on that aspect of his teaching which clearly treats corporate prayer in particular. Now, as most of you, I'm sure, know, there are only two explicit references to the ecclesia, the new covenant community as church, found in the gospel records. Both of them are found, of course, in the gospel of Matthew. And they are pregnant with important seminal teaching concerning the doctrine of the church in general and concerning the doctrine of corporate prayer in particular. The fact that Christ in his person and office well, let's turn to the passage, Matthew 16, Matthew 16, and I'll read starting in verse 13. Now, when Jesus came into the parts of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, 
and others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. It's interesting, they weren't saying he's one of the scribes. He said unto them, But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed it unto you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say unto you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Well, just very briefly, as we look at this passage, we see several vital things concerning the church as Christ's new covenant community. Number one, the fact that Christ himself is the architect and builder of this church. I will build my church. Number two, the fact that Christ in his person and office as the one true foundation is set before us upon this rock upon the rock of Peter's identification of Christ's person and his office. Ephesians 2 validates this, that the church that Christ builds is built upon the foundation of apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself, not Peter, the chief cornerstone. Thirdly, we see the fact that Christ by his power will make his church triumphant in its mission, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And fourthly, the fact that Christ, by his authority, commits the keys of the kingdom to his church, with a special place given to Peter in the use and exercise of those keys. You are Peter, I will give to you. And in our reaction to the Romish abuse of that passage, we must not undermine the clear pressure of the language of the passage. Peter has been given a peculiar place in the use of those keys. Then in Matthew 18, 15 and following, the second explicit reference to the church, there are several principles that lead us to see how strategic is this matter of corporate prayer. Matthew 18, 15. If your brother sin against you, show him his fault between you and him alone. If he hear you, you have gained your brother. If he hear you not, take with you one or two more, that at the mouth of two witnesses or three, every word may be established. Another principle extracted right from old covenant law. And if he refuse to hear them, tell it to the church. If he refuse to hear the church also, let him be unto you as the Gentile and the publican. Truly, I say to you, what things soever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. What things soever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say unto you, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father who is in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Here are several vital principles. Number one, the church in the exercise of its authority is the highest judicatory under the new covenant. Once the church has acted in concert, there is no gathering of other churches, no gathering of other leaders of other churches who can contravene the voice and decision of the church. Goodwin builds his whole treatise for the biblical concept of the independency and the ultimate authority of the local church upon this passage. And I think his treatment in volume 11 of his works is an unanswerable polemic for that. Secondly, the church in agreeing in corporate prayer 
is given an astounding promise of the efficacy of that corporate prayer. Again, I say to you, this amazing statement, if two of you shall agree on earth, using that verb from which we get our English word symphony, symphoneo, if you are speaking together, oneness of mind, oneness of heart, that one accord emphasis found in the early chapters of Acts, that God hears and answers corporate prayer that is true, unified, spirit, wrought, oneness in the prayers of God's people. And then thirdly, that astounding influence is vitally connected with the pledge and the fact of the presence of the living Christ in the midst of his gathered people as they gather to discipline and to pray. On the very surface of these texts, brethren, those are some amazing statements made by our Lord. In summary, what is significant in these observations is that our Lord Jesus envisions his church invested with the keys of the kingdom, graced with the promise and the reality of his special presence, carrying out its mission only in the context of a constant symphony of corporate prayer. The church Jesus builds, the church to which he commits the keys, the church in which he dwells, is not one which is invincible in the power of human ingenuity, human talents, human resources, Rather, it is that church which is invincible as she carries out her mission by the invincible power of God given to her in answer to her corporate and united prayers. That's the church Jesus envisions that he will build. So then, when we turn to our second category of text, in the life and experience of the apostolic church, we see how central was their corporate prayer life. We turn to Acts chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. Acts 1, verses 4 and 5. And being assembled together with them, he, Jesus, charged them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which said he, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> which said he, you have heard from me, for John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized in the Holy Spirit not many days hence. No command to pray, simply to wait. When we read Luke's account at the end of his gospel record, we are told they split their time between going into Jerusalem, worshiping in the temple, and coming back to that upper room and gathering to pray. These people that give the picture that they did nothing but pray during that entire period are simply overlooking what Luke says at the end of his gospel. It's, it's just clear as the nose on your face and mine. And they worshipped him, returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and were continually in the temple, blessing God. So when we read they were continually in the upper room praying, we've got to square it with Luke's previous statement, and he wouldn't contradict himself since he's the author of both Luke and of Acts. But now, as they take the command to wait, what do they do? Well, they're in Jerusalem worshipping, but now in verses 12 to 14 of Acts chapter 1, this is what we read. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near to Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey off. And when they were come in, they went up to the upper chamber where they were abiding, both Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, Simon the zealot, Judas, the son of James, these all, with one accord, if two of you shall agree on earth, with one accord, continued 
steadfastly in prayer with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with the brethren. And then verse 24 of the same chapter. And they prayed. In the midst of their praying, apparently the Spirit of God brought to mind and Peter speaks and says, wait a minute, Scripture says when Judas goes to his place, someone is going to rise up and take his place. They had come to understand most likely from the instruction of that 40-day period from their Lord what the requirements for that place would be. And so they are seeking to work out obedience to the present light they have. And so it comes down to where two men meet the qualifications as far as they can examine them. They're shut up to God and what do they do? They pray as a group. They pray and seek the mind of God in the selection of that replacement for Judas. Then we come to Acts 2 and verse 42. When the Spirit of God is poured out in power, and on that one day 3,000 are brought to sound conversion, what activity characterizes their life together? Verse 42 of Acts 2. And they, remember Peter, Peter, Luke wrote some 30 years after the fact, and looking back with historical accuracy, 30 years after the fact. This was not something written two days after the Holy Spirit came in 3,000 professed faith, only to find three months or three years later, you could only find 100. This was not like the fruit of modern evangelistic campaigns. 30 years later, allowing that some died, some may have apostatized because we see Ananias and Sapphira in the Jerusalem church. Later on, we see a Simon Magus. But Luke could write accurately over all that entire company what happened. These all that were added unto them continued steadfastly in the apostles' teaching and fellowship in the breaking of bread and the prayers, and the prayers. As surely as sitting under apostolic instruction was a distinctive new covenant activity, as surely as real koinonia, shared life, we know from the context, shared substance was part and parcel of their life together. They continued in fellowship. They continued most likely this is a reference to the remembrance of the Lord in his special way appointed by him. If not that, it speaks of their delightful social communion around their tables and as a distinct activity, the prayers, the corporate prayers. These all continued steadfastly. Now Lenski tries to call that, well, the prayers is synonymous to their normal worship services. But as so often happens where Lenski has marvelous insights in some places, in other places, he imports ideas. And I think the idea is imported, that the natural meaning of the passage is they continued steadfastly in the prayers. Now, whether it's speaking of the times of prayer the appointed times that they still attended at the temple and met as the new covenant community in Solomon's portico, all of that is open for further discussion and interaction and exegetical labor. But at the end of the day, if they continued steadfastly in the prayers, they was praying, and they was praying together. That was their life as the people of God. So then, we read on, and what do we find? Acts chapter 4. Two of the apostles face opposition for their public preaching. And what do they do when they are threatened, mistreated? Acts 4 and verse 23. Acts 4, verse 23. And being let go, that is let go by the authorities, they came to their own company. Now that could mean the apostolate. It could mean the entire church. It's not clear. But they came to their own 
company. In other words, these two come into a setting. There was corporate relationship and reported all that the chief priest and the elders had said unto them. And they, when they heard it, lifted up their voice to God with one accord. They were agreeing on earth as touch, touching what they were to ask and said, O Lord, you who made the heavens and the earth, etc. And as though God so smiled upon their posture that he said, I like what you're doing and I'm going to hear your cry that you would be given boldness and power to fulfill your unique apostolic ministry in healing, performing wonders to validate your message about Christ. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were gathered. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God with boldness. It's that final verse that leads me to say, I rather think when we read on the front end, they came to their own company, that this was the apostolate. Not everybody was preaching the word. But whatever that was, it was a corporate season of prayer involving at least the apostles. And as they agreed on earth, pleading with God to give them boldness, give them fresh endowment of the Spirit to fulfill their apostolic mission, God heard and wonderfully answered their prayers. And then we looked at the outset at Acts 12 under my definition that when Peter is in prison, the church is coming together, at least a large segment of the church, specifically to pray for Peter. This was a prayer meeting that had a very narrow focus of concern. And it's my own conviction. I don't believe they were praying necessarily that he would be spared, though that may have entered their prayers. Stephen had been martyred. But they also knew Peter's history, I'm sure. Peter told them what he did when crunch time came. I believe they were praying, Lord, give him courage, give him grace that he may not deny the name of your beloved son. And if he's to die like James did, may he die nobly and triumphantly as a martyr. And God said, I got something better and you know the story as well as I. But the point is, here was a crisis in their life together and it was a call to gather to pray. They didn't form a caucus and go to the authorities and petition them to release Peter. They got on their faces and they cried to the God of heaven. Bannerman has a marvelous quote that captures what I've been trying to demonstrate from the witness of Acts. I quote him now. The inner life of the church after the ascension of her Lord went on as it had begun in an atmosphere of prayer and praise. From the opening scene of the 120 in the upper chamber, all with one accord, continuing steadfastly in prayer, to the closing scene in this section of the history where we see many gathered together in the house of Mary praying, the voice of united prayer rises continually in the apostolic church. It is the unfailing resource in every difficulty and emergency in the church's affairs, in the choice of an apostle, in the training of young converts, in the appointment of the seven, in the consolidation of the church among the Samaritans, for the success of the apostles' ministry in Jerusalem when Peter and John are forbidden by the Sanhedrin to speak in the name of Jesus, when Peter is lying chained in Herod's prison to be put to death on the morrow. Only a few fragments of these prayers are recorded, but they are enough to give us some idea of their general character. They are simple, fervent utterances, breathing the Old Testament spirit of reverence and faith, combining direct petition with adoration and thanksgiving.
So, not only do we see the central place of corporate prayer in those seminal passages on the church, Matthew 16 and 18, but in the pattern of life in the apostolic church in its early days there in Jerusalem. From these passages, it is clear that there is a broad range of references to the experience of corporate prayer. But the central place of corporate prayer in the New Testament is not only to be seen in the teaching of our Lord and the recorded experience in the book of Acts, but in the third place, in the directives contained in the apostolic letters. And I want to make a point that may be very obvious to you, but I lived many years as a Christian before it became obvious to me. And it is this. Remember the nature of these apostolic letters. They were not composed so that believers from the time on from Gutenberg would have a book to take with them when they got alone in the morning to have their devotions. That's not why they wrote these letters. Prophetically seen down through the centuries and in time there would be printing presses and Christians would need something with which to have their devotions. So they wrote the letters. I read the apostolic letters for probably 10 years after I was a Christian, assuming that was the case. And then one day, like a 44 magnum shell hitting me in the middle of my temple. I said, oh, Paul, bond slave of Jesus Christ, to all that are at Rome. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the saints in Christ Jesus at Philippi. And it opened up a world to me that was like being dropped on a new planet. These letters were not composed to give me as a believer materials for my private devotions. They were written to churches to direct the life of those assemblies. And insofar as there are precepts and principles and and mandates and all the rest that I can and must appropriate individually and personally, the primary reference is apostolic letters to the churches. Now, granted, there are some individual letters, but even the majority of those Paul's two letters to Timothy, his letter to Titus, even his letter to Philemon, they have to do with church issues. So when we pick them up and read them that way, with this question in mind, do those letters emphasize the necessity of corporate prayer among and in those churches The answer is an overwhelming affirmative. Most of the commands having to do with prayer are second person plural imperatives. And there I've given you a whole list of those verses starting with Romans 12, 12 and concluding with Jude 20, building yourselves up in your most holy faith Praying in the Holy Spirit. That's my responsibility as an individual. Yes, but it was written to the people of God. And it is nothing less than a perversion of the Word of God to ignore the setting of these texts and to use them in any other dominant way other than that of exhortations with respect to the corporate prayers of the people of God. When reading the book of Acts, we must constantly remember the perspective placed upon the things it records given to us in Acts 1 and verses 1 and 2. We must read with this end in view or this perspective as we read. The former treatise I made, O Theophilus, concerning all that Jesus began both to do and to teach, until the day in which he was received up after he had given commandment through the Holy Spirit unto the apostles 
whom he had chosen. Luke makes it very plain that the activity of Jesus is not bounded by the gospel record. It is extended into the book of Acts. And so as Jesus is fulfilling his promise, I will build my church, the book of Acts is recording Christ's work in fulfillment of that prophetic utterance. From his place at the right hand of the Father, as the architect and builder of his church, the Holy Spirit on earth being the executor of his will and of his plan and his purposes, the church Christ molds and shapes as the new covenant community through the apostles. It is patent. He is making a community who place a high premium upon corporate prayer. That's the church Christ is building through his apostles. And so when we pick up their letters, writing to this church and to that church, the call goes forth, continue instantly, steadfastly in prayer, with all prayer and supplication, watching thereunto in perseverance and for all the saints. And then Paul says, and don't forget me, that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth and speak boldly as I ought to speak. If this is true, and I believe it is, and that the Bible forces this perspective upon us, any man concerned to administer the rule of Christ within the church of Christ, according to the word of Christ, must be concerned passionately about this matter of corporate prayer in the congregation where he labors as an under-shepherd. Now I know, and you know from your reading, when God pours out his spirit in power, what historically people call revival, when he gives a geographically bounded, intensified work of the ordinary ministry of the spirit, that's what I regard revival to be, not something different, but more concentrated of the ordinary work of the Spirit, we know when he does that, eminent prayerfulness by the people of God becomes a natural accompaniment of that intensified, concentrated presence and operation of the Holy Spirit. And we would expect that. He's the Spirit of grace and supplication, where he comes in a concentrated, intense way prayerfulness, eminent prayerfulness, will emerge. We understand that. However, such realities do not negate or neutralize our duty in seeking to cultivate in the minds of God's people a biblical view concerning the vital importance of corporate prayer in the life of the church. The same way we know if God comes in that geographically bounded, intensified ministry of the Spirit, sinners will get converted. But where there is no such concentrated, geographically bounded operation of the Spirit, do we still seek to get inside the conscience of the sinner and warn him and plead and entreat and weep? Yes, yes. Our duty is not affected by what God sovereignly does. And this is true with regard to corporate prayer among our people. Luke 18.1 stands as a monument against what I call the irresponsible escapism of an imbalanced obsession with revival. Men ought always to pray and not to faint, even in seasons of relative small things. Seasons of relative barrenness. Men ought, 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 ought always to pray. And then we add James 4.17 to that, to him that knows to do good and does it not, to him it is sin. Prayerlessness in a congregation 
in a season of relative barrenness is sin. And it is not proper simply to say, Oh Lord, send revival. And if and when you do it, the people will pray. When we have an obligation to instruct their conscience concerning their duty, to give direction to our seasons of corporate prayer, I have found that to be one of the most liberating things as a Christian and as a minister. What God does is God's business. What I do is my business as defined in the Bible. And that keeps your heart open and yearning for more than we've ever known. But it keeps you tethered to do what God tells you to do in the here and now. And surely, if God's going to visit his people, is he more likely to visit them when they are working and cultivating good biblical patterns of corporate prayer? Or when they're all just sitting back saying, we can't do nothing till God does everything? No, much more likely to come to a yearning, crying, pleading people than a people held in the grip of passivity. So, we've looked at the central place of corporate prayer in the teaching of our Lord, in the life and experience of the apostolic church, and its dominance. And I didn't read, I just give you the litany of verses. You can read them at your leisure. If you preach on the subject, I've given you a, a mini concordance, and you can take those texts. Now then, we come in the second place. Major principles which ought to condition and regulate corporate prayer in the church. But I think you've heard enough to challenge you in this hour, and it'd be best to break at this point, and then we'll pick up in the next hour with that second major heading, the major principles that ought to condition and regulate corporate prayer in the church. Let's pray together. Father, we are so thankful that you have given us a written record of your mind and of your will. We thank you for this marvelous promise given by our Lord Jesus, that if even two of us gather in your name and agree in a symphony of earnest, believing prayer, you will hear and you will answer us. We don't understand why you have given to the gathering of your people for prayer, this peculiar privilege. We confess, Lord, we have no real clear understanding as to why you have given such a promise, but that you've given it has stared into our eyeballs from the open pages of our Bibles. Help us to believe it. Help us to engage in it even now as with one heart we cry to you that our churches will be houses of prayer for all peoples. Anything that is hindering that, Lord, may we deal ruthlessly with it, even as our Lord did with the scourge of cords, that his temple might become that place where Gentiles would no longer have to walk by uh, cattle and change your money changers in their tables, but could find a refuge in the God of Israel in that place. So, Father, we commit to you the things we've considered in this hour and ask you by the Holy Spirit to write them upon our hearts. Hear our prayers as we offer them in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat>